Okay, guys. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, it's really good to have you. And thank you for, um, the, I know there's a bit of a time difference between where we are, hence it's nighttime for me and daytime for you. But um, I, I'm very proud to be joined by you guys from Soar for Climate. But um, before I go too much further, will you please tell me what that is? Carl, why don't you fire away on that one? Sure. Soil for Climate is a educational nonprofit uh, based in Vermont in the US. Uh, we were formed in 2015 with the goal of creating a community through which information, uh, research, videos, articles, and so forth could be shared throughout the world. Um, as committed climate activists, uh, Seth and I began to understand, we've been, he and I have been friends for almost 30 years now, um, but we began to understand back around 2005 or so, that just simply cutting emissions was not going to be good enough. We also had to get the excess carbon out of the air. So the question became, how do you do that? Where does it go? Um, what is the potential? You know, how quickly? And uh, the more we looked into it, the more we realized that soil was the obvious solution. And uh, we decided to lend our voices to that. So, Seth? Yeah, and, I, and I'll just say that, um... You know, we have a mission to support the science policy and practice of soil restoration as a climate solution. And so we, we have a compendium of peer reviewed research on the matter. Um, we have a database of healthy soils legislation in the United States. And, um, and then we support the practitioners by interviewing them and visiting them and, and, and documenting their work. And so we're, we're trying to build a movement, frankly. So uh, to advocate for soil, yeah. Yeah, so just, just to sort of understand the fundamental kind of um, fundamental point here is that you are not um, necessarily training people or running workshops that, or to do with regenerative agriculture. You're coming at this from uh, an unbiased um, environmental approach of how can we how can we work with climate change? How can we work, you know, how can we work to stop climate change? It's not, and how can soil be a factor in that? Rather than, yeah. say, rather than this sort of starting point of assuming that regenerative agriculture can do it and looking for places to fit it. Would that be right, the right way around? Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Our job is to be the conduit between the practitioners and the policy people and the scientists and the general public, and, and particularly in the climate community itself. So the climate community for which soil, um, Carl and I are, are you know, long active members of, um, isn't getting it about soil and particularly about grazing. And in fact, they're being antagonistic to it. They're, they're doing exactly the opposite of what they should be doing, which is to be supporting drawdown solutions and to be supporting grazing as as a um, as a way of building soil, and um, unfortunately, they're still under the misbelief that stopping emissions is going to somehow prevent a climate catastrophe. It's not. That boat has left. We're already past the point where just cutting emissions is going to be good enough. This idea of keeping it within 1.5 is is absurd. That's like saying, well let's hit the brick wall at 100 miles an hour instead of 150. It's like, no, I'd, I'd rather not hit the brick wall. And the way to not do that is by restoring soil and getting the atmospheric carbon out of the air. And grazing is absolutely fundamental to that. So we see ourselves as being the advocates mm -hmm. um, between the practitioners, that is the people who do the training and the, and the, and the producers who are producing food and, and, and uh, and the scientists who are taking the soil carbon measurements and, and the legislators who are trying to create healthy soils legislation, we're the conduit between that community and the, the climate community and, 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 and the climate you know, activist community, if you will. Okay, so, okay. sorry, can I just ask something within that? Um, you, you pointed to say that the climate kind of activist community are failing to recognize the role that um, soil and grazing can take in in removing carbon out of the atmosphere, rather than you know, rather than looking at the set of cutting emissions. But what I guess two questions really. First of all, what do people think is a better way of removing? And and um, 
and why do you think there is a resistance to acknowledge the role that grazing and soil can play in this? Uh, maybe I can respond to that. The only other alternative right now in general that's being discussed is what's known as CDR or carbon dioxide removal. Uh, typically they're uh, uh, technology based solutions, uh, giant machines that can scrub the carbon out of the air through chemical processes and so forth. Uh, those tend to be very expensive, uh, very uh, energy and, um, and resource in intensive. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't remove a, a whole lot of carbon. Uh, there was a, a plant being operated by Climeworks, uh, I believe in Iceland, uh, that uh, removed approximately 300 tons of carbon per year, which is about what you could accomplish on a 300 acre or 120 hectare farm um, at, at a profit. Uh, and this plant cost several million dollars. And the only reason that it worked was because it was using waste energy from a nearby production facility. And then you look at, well, what did they do with the carbon that was removed from the air? And it was being sold uh, for more uh, petroleum extraction, or it was being pumped into a greenhouse used to grow plants, which is a perfectly fine thing to do. But then, you know, the plants are then eaten a, a month or two months later and so forth. And all the carbon goes back into the air. So while it's better Absolutely. to recycle the carbon in the air than, you know, than not do anything with it, um, even better is finding a, a, a permanent or at least a semi-permanent repository, which is what we do have with soil. I think people tend to favor technological solutions because we're a technological soci society. Uh, certainly I'd worked with technology in the past and, finding this biological solution uh, challenged a lot of the paradigms that I held. Um, and on the, on the grazing side, there seems to, to be a, a, a way of thinking. Every, first of all, everybody tends to think that cows are bad. And, and why do they think this? It's because for 10,000 years, uh, grazing and animal agriculture has unfortunately been linked to soil degradation all, all over the world. So it's normal for people to think that way. Um, now that these new nature-based grazing systems have come, I mean, we, we know just by looking at nature that obviously grazing can happen in a way that's beneficial because it's been going on beneficially for tens of millions of years. So really it was just waiting for uh, someone to notice what was different with how grazing took place in nature. And there were a couple of uh, heroes who stand out in this regard in the 1950s, Andre Voisin, a French grazing scientist began to understand you had to keep the animals grouped together into herds and move them often. And then uh, in the 1970s, um, uh, wildlife biologist Alan Savory in Zimbabwe realized that if you tried to apply Wassen's uh, approach in dry land, really challenging areas, um, it, it just wasn't lacking enough nuance. It needed a little more rigor. And Alan, realized, Alan Savory realized that he could take this military planning chart that he had learned as a student and apply it to a grazing situation where you're monitoring every variable, the rainfall, the hours of sunlight, the length of the growing season, the plant conditions, you know, the animal life cycles. And if you put all this information in, then you could really closely monitor and fine tune and really graze strategically. Um, and, and, and with this discovery, we now know how it's possible to use grazing to restore degraded soil and degraded grasslands all over, all, all over the world. Um, Today, there, according to a 2013 study by David Pimitel, there are about 2 billion hectares, about 5 billion acres of degraded, abandoned cropland in the world today, which is more land than is presently used for growing crops. It's an astonishing number. Sorry, can I just... So there's more X cropland that we can no longer use than there is current cropland in production. And that's... That is exactly correct. Trashed that through in, improper, I'm not gonna say grazing, but agricultural practices that presumably include arable and grazing and just, just degenerative practice. That's terrible. Uh, plowing has destroyed soil all over the world going back for thousands of years. Uh, David Montgomery has done a lot of uh, research into this. He's got a great book called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations for anyone listening who might wanna dig into this further. Um, and, and it has literally been going on. We now know um, William Rudderman had a wonderful paper in Scientific American in 2005 asking, when did anthropogenic climate change begin? Mm -hmm. And he put the date right about 10,000 years ago when agriculture began, we began, we started to physically alter the atmosphere, you know, as shows up in the ice core records. Uh, Jonathan Sanderman at uh, Woodwell Research Center, a climate think tank, 
uh, not too far from us in Massachusetts, um, has also looked at uh, how many billions of tons of carbon have been lost from the soil as a result of uh, cropping and grazing done uh, improperly over, over the years, or over the centuries. Um, but we now know how to reverse this. And it turns out that cropland is generally former grassland because grasslands are where the deepest, richest soils were found. So that's where agriculture was done. And what do you need to restore grassland? Well, you need to bring back the beneficial grazing impact that this land co-evolved with over tens of millions of years. So at a practical level to do a landscape restoration, grazing is the only means, regenerative grazing is the only means to really bring that back. And Seth, I don't know if you wanna to add to what, to what I've shared. Well, I've actually got a, a question that's come up, which I intended to ask you guys at some point, and you kind of uh, led me quite neatly into it, Carl, when you were describing the early practices there from you know, the 50s and then Alan Savory's tweaking of it in the 70s. Um, we often you know, have people asking questions on social media, well, okay, this is all very well, but wouldn't it be better just to leave it alone to recover on its own? You know, where, um, I think the term rewilding has got a lot of press in the UK now. Um, and there's a lot of people who, who don't understand the process. And I, with my limited knowledge, have tried to argue that actually managed grazing can do more good in terms of restoring um, ecosystems than just simply leaving it alone to rebalance itself. Because if we have a system that's been put very out of balance, let's say, um, you know, like we've been talking about arable um, that's been done for decades, that become chemically dependent on fertilizers and inputs to grow monocrops, you've got the choice of you can either just leave it alone and let nature take care of it. It's gonna take a very, very long time before equilibrium and balance is sorted. Or, and this is what my understanding of it is, I'd like you to just to corroborate this, is that we can manage the recovery and it'll happen an awful lot quicker. And the bonus is if we do that with grazing animals, it's also providing calories, food, nutrition for us at the same time. Have I understood that correctly? I think everything you said is correct. I would add one nuance to it, which mm -hmm. is that broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, and it's not a black and white scale, but there are two different types of environments or, or ecosystems around the world. There are those that get rainfall pretty much every month of the year, so they remain humid or are islands surrounded by water. So there's always moisture in the air, always moisture in the soil. Um, for example, where we are here in New England or, or, or Western Europe, uh, classic examples, uh, Eastern US, uh, those sorts of environments, regardless of how badly you treat the soil, something will always grow back because there is always moisture in the soil. So, so regeneration will happen if you just leave the land alone, if you let rest operate. However, what you just said is, is true. If you bring animals into it, that whole succession process happens so much faster because of the, the greater nutrient cycling and the faster nutrient cycling and so on. Um, the other type of ecosystem around the world, which actually is present on much more of the planet, are these seasonal rainfall systems that tend to have like a monsoon season. You get your rainfall typically over a several month period and the rest of the year could be bone dry. Those types of env environments, which are uh, also called brittle environments, uh, will not heal on their own. And if the land becomes degraded and in, in it looks like desert turns into sand, those places you can leave them for tens, hundreds, thousands of years and they remain desertified, which is exactly what's going on, for example, in large parts of the Middle East that were desertified thousands of years ago and have never been brought back, despite the fact that in most areas there's no more grazing taking place or, or any agricultural activity at all. So to bring back those those parts of the world, you absolutely need to bring in the grazing animals. And would that would, would that environment also include, um, like for example, the Great Plains of America, like you know the 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 prairies of Canada? I mean, um, you know, I'm I'm half Canadian. My mum grew up in the in the prairies, and you know, not far from Winnipeg. And I know the climate there is is difficult. <laughs> you know, it's kind of. So plus um, plus thirty summers and minus thirty winters, and you know, um, it's. It, I can imagine once that's degraded, it's not going to recover like a field in England would. I, I, it's, it, but that's a huge area. This sort of stepland area is, is. Would that fall under that brittle category? Exactly. In fact, most of the world's grasslands fall into that brittle category. Um, grasslands tend to receive somewhere between 
as little as four inches up to maybe 20 inches of rain per year. Uh, typically above that level, you tend to get uh, trees, it's enough rainfall to support trees. And when you get into even higher rainfall, uh, then you have forests, completely forested areas. But yes, uh, west of the 100th meridian in the US is typically where the rainfall um, uh, decreases pretty sharply. Um, and it, and it's a, the environment ecosystem reacts in a very different way than, than someplace like New England. So um, animals, no, no ecosystem evolved without animals. So animals are always an inherent part of an ecosystem. Um, the challenge is to manage them properly so that their impact on the land can be beneficial rather than destructive. Got you. So that, that was a very, there's a point in there which, which I've made just when debating people a lot from, you know, from our um, social media accounts is that there are no monocrops in nature. There are also no veganic crops and no animal only crops. Um, all, you know, all systems of plants and animals exist together in to some degree. Um, they're never separated. Um, and I think that that's a, to me is a key point in this whole idea of when you're trying to increase biodiversity, it, everything you can do to increase biodiversity will have a knock-on effect of regeneration. Biodiversity is critical. In fact, I've come to think of fertility as being a, an emergent property of biodiversity. And it was Gabe Brown, the American farmer uh, who's in the Netflix documentary, uh, mm -hmm. Dirt to Soil, um, I'm sorry, Kiss the Ground, in his yep. book, he's author of the book, uh, Dirt to Soil, One Family's Journey into Regenerative Agriculture. Uh, it was when he began planting incredibly diverse cover crop mixes, you know, 50 or 60 species of different plants that he began to see, combined with managed grazing, that he began to see this very rapid improvement in soil health. And he has a um, uh, restoring soil with diversity, I believe is a talk that uh, Gabe gave at one point. And that helped me to understand that if you can just throw enough biodiversity into a, a, a situation, nature will figure out uh, how to respond and how to put the pieces together. And Gabe has used no synthetic fertilizer, no fossil fuel-based fertilizer since 2007. Um, in fact, he just won an award from the, the Heinz Foundation um, to, to acknowledge his regenerative agriculture successes. And when you go to his farm, it's like a Garden of Eden. You know, there's so much wildlife. The water running off his property is crystal clear and you know, drinking water quality really sets the model for what agriculture can be. So that that's it's what yeah what you said is quite you know fascinating and inspirational and the bit i guess which could be presented as a problem is that we generally you know i think pretty much more people eat arable crops than that there are very few pure true carnivores in the human race you know we we, we like our meat and our vegetables and our grains and our seeds and our nuts and everything else so um, you know, you've talked about how we could maybe restore ecosystems and biodiversity and sequester some carbon through grazing, but what do we do about the land that is currently arable? Because um, obviously that needs to stay in food production as well. We need to keep feeding ourselves. How, how does that work? We, we were talking about the Great Plains of America, which, which would have been, um, which more so than the UK, I, I, I would suspect, would have been natural grasslands, or a, a lot of the UK would have been forest unless it had some elevation to it. Um, how can we continue to farm on that land in a way that is not destructive? How can we, is it a case that we need to put animals into rotation, or is it a case that we can actually produce arable in a way that is a net gain to the environment rather than a net loss, if that makes sense? Okay. Um, but basically, uh, we refer to it as the Karoo photo or the fence line photo. It's sort of a classic photo taken in the Karoo region of South Africa. I'm into the Karoo. And, Incredible and, yeah. and, and it really, the picture looks fake. You, there's literally is a fence, a metal fence. And on one side of the fence is a lush grassland. And on the other side of the fence is a desert. And, and I say, well, isn't it convenient that they put that fence right at the border between the grassland and the desert? And, and when people who don't understand what's going on look at that picture, they think that the picture on the desert side is to side with the animals, because they think the animals have overeaten. But it's just the opposite. The okay. desert side is to side without the animals. The side with the animals is a side that's healthy, that has all the good grass and the carbon drawdown and is, and is doing what's called the small water cycles. 
And, but it's not just animals arbitrarily. This person is a holistic practitioner. This, this, um, this producer is practicing holistic plant grazing. So he has m many small paddocks and he's moving the animals in a dense herd according to all the various uh, um, variables that he's accounting for. And there's their response. Um, Gay Brown in North Dakota um, has a similar situation, which I've been, I've been to these places, like literally across the street, like literally there's a street and on the other side, and I, I see this all over. You see the guys in monocrops and that, in that case, he's in um, uh, rapeseed for canola oil. This is his neighbor. Um, in, in, uh, in Georgia, I just visited Will Harris at White Oak Farms. He's surrounded by cotton and it's just bare ground. It's like desert all around him. You see the industrial um, uh, cotton um, fertilizer things. And, and he's and on Gabe's on Gabe's property, on this fellow in the Cruz property, on Will Harris's property. It, it's, it's like a, it's like a, a verdant, um, you know, island of this dream of tall grass and biodiversity. I've, and it, I've and seen it, UK. I mean, I've yeah. seen exactly what you're describing. It's not just a desert thing. You know, one of the First farms I visited when we were starting the agriculture, the farmer was taking arable and converting it into pasture. And it was, it was a single track road. So it was the same land. One side was 10 degrees hotter. The soil was yellow and it picked up a handful. And it ran through your fingers. It was, it was like sand. The other side, the soil was dark brown, cool, wet and crumbly and beautiful, right. like, like, like chocolate cake, you know. Right. So, right. And, and right. that, the same, I'm sorry. Land, you know, and and of course it's full of soil carbon, and there's there's livestock being managed properly to restore it, and so really the veganic future is desertification. It's basically, um, you know, Earth becoming a desert, hot, runaway global warming planet. There is no survival for humanity in a veganic future. There is no such thing as organic agriculture. This thing is 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 this. Uh, it's this pipe dream hallucination that's now being pumped up by big ag, by Dow Chemical, by Bayer, by Monsanto, by, by Silicon Valley, so they can sell, you know, a fake food. It's basically intellectual property. I mean, that's what the Impossible Burger is. It's not food. It's really a packet of intellectual property. It's a series of patents that you're literally swallowing patents. Uh, this has nothing to do with food or soil or climate. All that is a complete facade. That's a complete front. And it's really horrifying, frankly, that people at The Guardian and at um, um, Oxford are just falling in line with this, with this phony end of the world narrative. And that's what it is. It's an end of the world narrative. And there is a comet coming to Earth. It is global warming. It is going to create the end of civilization unless we stop it. And the way we stop it is to restore soil around the world. And that is going to require regenerative grazing at, at scale. And so when you talk about, well, what are we going to do with the Midwest? You know what we're going to do? We're going to turn it back to tall grass prairie. So no, we're not going to be growing corn. We're not going to be growing soy. We're not going to be growing rapeseed. We're not going to be growing wheat. You want to know what? There's going to be more meat, not less, more. And what there's going to be less of is bread and cookies and crackers and fake pea, soy, protein, isolate um, things. You'll probably be eating meat three times a day, and that may be all you'll be eating, meat and water. And and then vegetables that are grown in a rotation with the grazing, in a rotation with the grazing. That's the only way to grow vegetables sustainably is in a rotation with grazing. So this is the radical transformation that's coming to the world. It's gonna be a world of more meat because we're restoring 10 billion acres of land and grazing is how you have to do it. We're not, the Midwest is not gonna be in corn. It's not gonna be in soy. It's not gonna be in wheat. It's not gonna be in rapeseed. It's not gonna be in pea. Yeah. It's gonna be healthy grass maintained with grazing. So get used to the meat future, which is the soil carbon future, which is the climate change I mean, mitigation future okay there you know you know we just have to speak truth to power at this point there's no point in just pretending like oh listen to us like no this is the way it's going to be and i'm sorry 
to the people at the Guardian and Oxford uh, and Harvard that. who are pushing this fake solution. Get over it. The time of accounting is now. We need the, the science on soil carbon sequestration to be the main story on the Guardian, to be the main story on the BBC. There needs to be an entire branch at Oxford that's talking about soil carbon and how to prove it. We need economics to be behind that. We need, we need a price on soil carbon and whether it's cryptocurrency or whatever it is, we need, we need the insurance companies to start changing how they underwrite crop insurance, flood mitigation insurance, it, all of that. So, okay, there you go. Um, just before we, we jumped onto a different Zoom call there, Seth, you gave a very impassioned and um, you both barrels account of what needs to happen um, to stop impending climate doom. The problem we have with this is that the misinformation around the role of grazing ruminants, um, it's so skewed into that cow farts are leading us into this fiery doom of hell. How do we break this narrative? I understand that the narrative is created because of finance and commerce and business. And the fact is, if you can sell a Beyond Burger, which is highly manufactured from cheap commodity crops with the guise that it's doing better for the planet and, the, uh, and you can control all the ingredients and the 12 patents on it and things like that, I get everything you said. I totally agree with you. And I think the public have been conned and duped into thinking this diet will save the world. How do we, how do we combat that? Surely what we need now is a lot of hard science. How's that going? Where's it coming from? Okay, so um, we don't need a lot of science. The science is already there. It's been there for 50 years. Uh, 50 years ago, Alan Savory showed um, plots in New Mexico that hadn't been grazed in decades, there'd been no cows on them in decades, and they were pure desert. And so obviously it wasn't the grazing that was causing the problem. You know, they've, they've known this for over half a century. And, um, and they will always just keep saying, oh, we need more science. No, you don't. The science is there. It's obvious. It's intuitive. There's clearly a difference between livestock that would be managed as proxies for wild herds and, and livestock that are just sort of scattered around. Um, obviously the world evolved with massive grasslands. There were huge soil carbon stores with massive herds of animals on most of the continental interiors. This is all obvious. They've, they've known it for decades. Y you know, yes, more science is good, but don't pretend that that's, you know, th this isn't about science. This is about business. They basically want to vertically integrate the entire food supply so that intellectual property processed through cheap commodities like GMO soy with chemicals is suddenly food, is suddenly meat. And so, and so just get animals out of the picture entirely. Like instead of feeding the grain to the animals, they'll just feed it to people. So basically we're the new livestock. Humans are the new livestock. And this the dystopian Pat Brown, Jeff Bezos um, uh, future, intellectual property is food, humans, humans are livestock. And the idea of an independent producer producing anything, carrots, tomatoes, let alone meat, that idea itself is a threat to their worldview. It's not just about me. This is another thing I want people to realize. This is about the future of food, period. All food, their future, their vision is gonna be in massive greenhouses, harvested with robots, precision yeah. agriculture, injecting water and fertilizer at exactly the right moment. There won't be any um, independent producers. This is the ultimate vision that big commerce, big high tech, the commodity markets, Silicon Valley, and then ironically, the Hollywood, the liberal Hollywood scene is sort of, is sort of going along with this narrative. This is the end of all pastoral people, the end of the Maasai, you know, all of East Kenya, East Africa will become a desert. Um, they'll just push the people off the land, the multinationals will buy it all up. They'll drill wells, they'll create these huge greenhouses, they'll 
it's all, of course, fossil fuel dependent. I mean, you know, it's still 100% dependent on, on, on oil, natural gas. Um, and then people will be in these sort of cluster slums and they'll be fed this fake protein totally isolate. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be fed this yeah. fake protein isolate. So, so that's the horrifying future that, 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 that unfortunately the yeah. Guardian and, the, and, the, and Oxford and the BBC, they're all complicit in this future. And if they really want an organic earth-based um, climate um, change mitigating future, then they need to be 100% behind regenerative grazing. So where, with, okay, the, I, I can kind of understand some of the big business getting behind this, as you quite rightly said, you know, uh, there's big businesses, shareholders profits, and there's a lot of short sighted practices that occur when people are just chasing money. But can we talk for a minute about grazing and confused? Because this is, this is a report that we have thrown in our faces on a daily basis by um, vegans, plant-based people. There you go from Oxford University. You know, this isn't some like crack pop. Yeah. This isn't earthling egg yeah. rabbiting on about something. This yeah. is Oxford yeah. University, which everybody's supposed yeah. to trust. Yeah. What, what went so wrong there? How did that happen? Because, and what does it actually say? And where do the figures come from? I'd like you to, because I know personally, we, we've spoken a little bit about this before, but could you just give us a brief kind of surmise of what went right or wrong about Grace and yeah. Well, Well, actually, it's really not from Oxford University. It's from the, um, it, it's from a group that, that has some affiliation. It's Tara Garnett's group. It's not technically Oxford. It's the Food Climate uh, Research Network. Um, uh, and, you know, and, and Tara Garnett has no credibility. Sorry, Tara. Um, um, she is a, uh, an, an anti-meat advocate. She's pro-plant food and she selectively chooses her data to support her disposition and, and then ignores all the abundant evidence against it. And of course, that's exactly what her um, funders want. So it, it frankly, it's an embarrassment to Oxford and um, is Oxford needs to distance itself from the Food Climate Research Network. Um, they should be paying more attention to Miles Allen, who is also at Oxford, who has just redone all the, the modeling on how methane should be accounted for. I'll give you an example of what Tara Garnett did wrong with her paper is she completely ignored Teague 2016. Okay, her paper came out in Teague in, uh, in 2017. So for her not to know about this seminal paper, we call it Teague um, 2016. Uh, the, the formal title is uh, The Role of, of Ruminants in Reducing Agricultural Footprint or Carbon Footprint, uh, Richard Teague, T-E-A-G-U-E. -E. Um, she just ignored it, you know, and uh, what's his name does the same thing, um, uh, Matthew Hayek. You know, they're, they're just choosing to just ignore the research that stands that stands against them. And T2016 is just one example. There's a, there's 2013, 2011. There's there's other professors who are publishing um, in this space. Um, and now Matthew Hayek has a new paper out which says, oh, regenerative grazing doesn't work. Well, he ignores all the science that he does. That it does. He ignores. Uh, to Stanley 2018, he ignores Roundtree 2020. I mean, if you just go about ignoring all the science that doesn't support your anti-meat disposition, well, then obviously you're going to come to that conclusion. But these, quite frankly, are not credible. Um, um, no, so Tara, Tara Garnett... Paper. It's simply bad, it's biased, bad paper, badly researched, um, and it was entered into with a pre-existing bias. It, well, it, 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 it's fake. I mean, these are basically position white papers that are, you know, artificially buttressed um, and, and they have, they manage to finagle some sort of connection with Oxford to make it look like they're credible, but they're not credible. Frankly, it's an embarrassment to Oxford. And there are people at Oxford, you know, vice presidents and chancellors at Oxford need to take a closer look 
at what the Food Climate Research Network is doing because it's, it, it, it's actually a blemish on Oxford. And so they need to reevaluate that. If you want to get more into the, uh, the technical side of this, and I don't know if this is appropriate for the podcast, um, but Tara Garnett is and her team make the same mistake that other academic researchers have, uh, and that is relying on research that fails to differentiate between rotational grazing and holistic planned grazing. Um, now, I'm not a rancher, you know, I had no clue anything about grazing. You know, I it was lucky to have seen cows out in a pasture, you know, once or twice in my life, you know, driving by. Um, but the fact is, historically, most grazing is continuous grazing. You just put the animals out, you forget about them. It's unmanaged. They eat whatever they want, whenever they want to. So there's, there's no rhyme or reason to the grazing. Rotational grazing, which is also an ancient practice, means moving the animals periodically. You know, maybe they graze on this field this summer, maybe that field, you know, that pasture next summer and so forth. Um, again, no thought given to bunching the animals into a herd, you know, moving the herd strategically so that they're where you want them, when you want them to get the desired impact and so on. And holistic plan grazing in, is, as I mentioned earlier, has just so much more nuance because you're monitoring all these different variables and adjusting in a very conscious way, just uh, you decide what is the impact that you want and what is it gonna to take to get there and then you apply it. Um, and the, the issue is, is that from the surface, rotational grazing, which is generally based on a calendar. So like every Monday or once a month, you move the animals to a new pasture or once a week or something like that. It, it, that type of approach, which is a system, a, a rote system does not take into account all of these vicissitudes that are accommodated through a more sophisticated approach like holistic plant grazing. But on the surface, it looks about the same. You've got animals, you're moving animals here to there, you know, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the research that has been done historically claiming to be of holistic plan grazing, when you actually dig down and look at the protocol, you find out, in fact, it's a form of rotational grazing. And if, you, if you're a researcher who then relies on this science saying, oh, we looked at holistic plan grazing and we didn't see any conclusive, you know, evidence that it's, it's better, um, it, it's a very misleading and it's a travesty within the world of range ecology that Alan Savory's work has been misrepresented. And this has led to a lot of flawed con conclusions. Thankfully, the newer researchers uh, that um, Seth was talking about a minute ago, people like Richard Teague, Paige Stanley, Jason Roundtree, they understand this nuance and they're studying farms where people do have the skill and the knowledge to be able to apply this approach in a way that that works out consistently and, and effectively. No, that's amazing. And because I, I, I've often had, you know, people say to me, well, there's no evidence it works. There's no evidence, there's no evidence for, <laughs> for you know, that, that regenerative agriculture plant grazing, that, that it can actually, and we, I, think we have to, I, think, I think we have to define what we mean here by works. Like, what are we saying it works? So in my, in my view, uh, what works is within a closed carbon loop of a field where the plants are taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the animals are eating them and then releasing some of that. I would consider that any sequestration is a net loss to the environment of carbon. Would, is that something you guys would agree with or have I got the, the details a bit wrong? Carl, why don't you take that? Sure. Um, it's when you're taking carbon, out of the air and putting it into the soil, you can say that it's a, it's a net loss from the, the closed system, that the total amount of carbon remains the same, or historically, if we look back at ice core records going back uh, approximately 800,000 years or so, we can see that the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere fluctuated during that time from about a, a low of about 180 parts per million to a high of about 280 parts per million. During the time that the atmospheric levels were higher, it means that there was less carbon in the soils and in the ocean. And conversely, when the atmospheric uh, levels went down, there was more carbon in, in the soils and, and the, in the ocean. So there's a certain homeostasis uh, that is continued on for millions of years that has only recently been disrupted through, um, well, originally agriculture, deforestation, uh, burning, plowing, right. mismanaged grazing, and so forth. So and the then, volume of course, carbon is constant. It's just a case of where it is, right? Correct. Yeah, globally, the amount of carbon that we have to work with is, is a fixed amount. Yeah, and, and that's true of 
fossil fuels and soil carbon and trees and plants and everything. It's just where where it where it is now and when was it last in the atmosphere that that's kind of important and how can we yeah how can we get a little out of the atmosphere and, and put it back into the ground or, or, or away which is what we discussed in the very beginning you were talking about that machine in in iceland which i'd, I'd read about you know it's a a, a kind yeah. of chemical solution but if, um, if i may just add add one point to this sure. um often we speak about sequestration which the word sequester actually means to kidnap or to lock away and, and we should not think about carbon being sequestered. It's actually cycling through the ground. And, and the goal is to have as much of it cycling through the soil as possible, because some is always being lost, some is being added. We want to increase the rate at which it's being added and decrease the rate at, at which it's being given off. And, and this leads to another important point is that very often when we use the term carbon sink, we tend to think of it as a, as a, as a tub almost that can only hold so much carbon. And in fact, this, this analogy is misplaced. Um, Tom Newmark, our colleague uh, who's with the Carbon Underground, did a wonderful essay on this a couple of months ago, where he says, don't call nature a sink, I believe was the title of it. We, instead, we need to think about soil as a, as a living system, as a living organism that can grow. So while there is, yes, a physical limit as to how much a certain amount of carbon that can be held by soil, there is no limit to how much soil can be formed. So this issue of, of carbon saturation in soil is again a wrong way to think about it. I mean, all, all we need to do is to look at the great grasslands of the world where there's 10, 15, 20, in some cases 30 feet or, or 10 meters of, of as soil. Much as, that, as much as 10 meters of, of topsoil. In some parts of the world, wow. that, that's correct. You know, incredibly deep soil. And uh, I've heard tell of, uh, of roots that can penetrate as, as far as 100 feet down the wow. you know miners working in mines have found you know roots of trees extending 30 meters down into the soil i mean it's 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 mind blowing um, and you know certainly here in north america the, the soil was uh, probably 3 to 4 meters deep it was it was the envy of the world so we and this was after it had all been scraped clean about 12,000 years or so ago when the glaciers came through um, and and it's been building up since then so we know just by looking around the world at at the evidence that the soil can accumulate over thousands of years. So, so this notion that, that soil tops out, it's you know, the maximum amount of carbon it can hold after a decade or a couple of decades or something like that is, is completely fallacious. Um, Alan Williams, uh, who works with an organization called Understanding Ag and is a colleague of Gay Brown's, um, a, a talk he gives, he reports of, of this family. And, and I had the opportunity to ask him, is, is this unique or do you see it everywhere? And he said, it is so, he said, we see it all the time. And, and what it is, is these ranchers are able to grow over an inch or close to three centimeters of soil per year. And if you look at the US Department of Agriculture or other uh, most soil society websites or soil scientists, you, you'll hear them say that it takes 500 to 1000 years to I've, form a centimeter of soil. Yeah. I've read that, that same statistic when, when if, if without animals, if you just left, you know, a bare surface, you're forming 500 to 1000 years per inch. And, and, and yeah. Christine Jones, a soil ecologist from Australia, says basically when that the confusion arises because, yes, it takes that long to, to uh, for weather to break down rock. So that's true. But she goes on to say that forming topsoil can be breathtakingly rapid. It is a completely different biological process involving root exudates, you know, plants during photosynthesis, pumping carbon sugars into the ground to feed the soil life. And so this notion that it takes a, a thousand years to form three centimeters of soil, we need to move beyond that because if that were truly the case, there would be no hope for getting the carbon out of the atmosphere in a time frame consistent with the continuation of civilization. Thankfully, we know how to do it so quickly um, you know, a question that arises is, well, how much, how long will it take to get all the excess carbon out of the atmosphere? And uh, Dr. Ratan Lau, probably the leading soil scientist in the world at Ohio State University here in the US, um, has estimated that within 80 years, in other words, by the year 2100, if we did, if we managed all of our ecosystems properly, we could probably, he predicts, uh, remove all of the excess carbon from the atmosphere. Now that would require, you know, a cessation of burning fossil fuels and so forth. But to think that we could accomplish this over a human lifetime, in my mind, oh, brings so much hope to this discussion. 
That is truly extraordinary. Guys, I'm really going to have to hit you up for some um, uh, citations and links um, that I'd like to include with this podcast because I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough to know where to find uh, the data that you're referring to. And I really would like to include it for anyone who wants to kind of dig a bit deeper. But I mean, it, it seems very clear to me that we have a solution, but the difficulty is how do we turn this into policy and how do we, um, how do we, yeah, how do we turn it into policy? How do we get the decision makers on board? Okay, so th this is what I wanna say about that. People just have to see it with their own eyes. They need to go to the regenerative operations and they literally need to stand in the field and see the soil. Then they need to go across the street to the veganic operation um, that's growing rapeseed. Um, and they need to look at that soil. They need to see it for themselves. And, um, you know, getting back to the science thing, you know, the, 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 the fact is Tara Garnett, Matthew Hayek, uh, George Mambio, they don't care about the science. They're not science-based and showing them more science isn't going to matter. They've, they've, they've um, made their point. They will ignore the science that disagrees with their anti-meat narrative. So more science doesn't matter. What matters is getting the public to stand in restored fields and see it for themselves, to dig into the soil and to see it. That's the future. Never mind the, the guardians of the, of the faulty narrative. We're going to circumvent them by going directly to the public and by having them see the soil. And, and, um, and remember in the movie, Don't Look Up, you know, where she's saying, well, don't look up. You know, well, our narrative now is don't look down. You know, I mean, it's, of course, what we mean is do look down, but, but we're doing the, the, the satire and the sarcasm, yeah. you, know, you know, because, you know, look down, look at the soil. And, and so, and so that, that's how we're going to win this. And policy, way you, the way you get to policy people is you talk about things like flood, drought, runoff, um, uh, new, new, you know, nutrition, the whole, the whole teen problem with kids with uh, the attention deficit disorder and, and the anorexia and the diabetes. That's not because of meat. It's because of all this grain and sugar crap. Okay, it's not meat that's the problem. So, so these are the issues that the policy people have to address. And, and, and to put a, a shout out for, for Alan Savory, he would say, well, the, the manage itself has to be holistic. That means you need to be planning in a, in a holistic way, which is inclusive of all the variables and all the stakeholders. And people start by simply saying, well, well what future do we want? You know, do we want clean water? Do we want healthy children? Uh, do we want to be more or less free of, of diseases associated with diet? Um, and, then, and then you can build from that. If you do say, so, well, how can we do that? You know, can grazing be part of that solution? Well, what would that look like? And then who are those stakeholders? So, so this sort of methodology of planning itself. So you have the science, which is obvious, which is clear and has been for decades. Okay, but now you have the methodology of planning. How do we plan for a better future? And that's really what we need to think about. And a, a, a shout out to, to Alan Savory. He would say, well, we need to do holistic management. Okay, um, I'm, I'm obviously completely on board with your sentiment, but um, since you guys are, you're running as a nonprofit, right? You're a charity. So a large part of what you do is information um, as a sort of way of, of wrapping up what we've talked about here, um, I wonder if you could help me with something. If somebody who has listened to this podcast and thinks, do you know what? I'm on board with this. I agree with it. What can they, what can they do? How can they help this movement or this idea? Is it a case of, let's say, using media? Let's say if you, if you have the ability to make a little documentary or something, go and do that, take pictures. If you can write, then write about it. How, what, what can people physically do, intellectually do, who are already kind of on board with this as an idea? How can we all spread the message um, to a point where it's actually gonna make a difference? 
because we're fighting a very we're fighting a juggernaut of industry um, against this um, the big plant based con. <laughs> right, the great lie. Yeah, um, uh, Carl, why don't you uh, take it first? Sure. I I think uh, the most important thing that we can do is to support the farmers and the ranchers who are making this happen. Uh, it's often not easy for the consumer when they go into the supermarket. Uh, they can be a bewildering array of messages. Uh, I just read uh, yesterday about a, a new labeling system on low carbon beef that's going to be introduced here in, in the US soon. Uh, the Savory Institute has what they call their EOV or ecological outcome verification label. They're working land with a the number of yeah. land, part of their land to market program so that the consumer has the assurance independently verified that the product that they're buying is going to restore the landscape to improve the local economy yeah. um, and to, uh, to you know, help the farmers and ranchers achieve you know, a better lifestyle. Um, so uh, if you can patronize farmers markets, that's terrific. If you can work toward improved labeling, you know, that, that's terrific. So no matter what field you're in, um, there are you know, activities like this that, that can be done. Uh, if people want to support our work, they're more than happy to uh, to, to buy one of our hats, uh, as, as Seth is so ably modeling there. Um, and uh, as a nonprofit, um, you know, we're happy to accept donations. Um, we haven't talked too much about it yet. Seth mentioned the Maasai, but we're working now uh, with several communities in Africa, in Kenya, in Tanzania on agroforestry and also regenerative grazing based land restoration programs. Um, and so uh, we welcome any assistance that, that people might be able to, um, to provide during that. Uh, to my mind, um, economics is going to be the, the biggest driver. And I'm really excited to see that a lot of these regenerative farmers are uh, very profitable because they no longer have to pay for the fertilizers and the pesticides and so on. And, and it used to be said, well, if you're organic, you're not as productive. Uh, but just a few days ago, I learned of a farmer, I believe it was in South Carolina, who completely regenerative, who um, just broke the, the state's record uh, for the, uh, the production of crops. I think it was the type of corn that he was growing um, per acre. So, so we, it, you know, it's given a lie to that thought that you have to keep applying more and more uh, fertilizer every year. Um, and ultimately, as, as more and more farmers become profitable doing this, then I think that'll be the, the greatest push uh, in this direction. That's amazing. And I think that's a really kind of wonderful wrap up. So the only last thing is just to say, guys, um, I'll obviously put the link in, but just say where people can find you and more information around what you guys are doing. Our website is soil for climate. It's the number four soil for climate.org. And our Facebook community, which has over 27,000 members is just the soil for climate uh, Facebook group. Uh, for your listeners in the UK, we also have a Soil for Climate uh, UK group that formed recently as well, so they may wish to join that. Amazing. And, and also, Glenn, uh, it's been a joy to be here. And um, on behalf of Soil for Climate, I'm happy to virtually present you with a Soil for Climate hat. There it is going to the virtual background. Okay, and uh, we'll, we'll mail you one and, and uh, you can have it someday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. I've got some incredible insights from this and there's some wonderful quotable snippets that I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing with our, um, our followers there. That's been very kind for you to share me your time. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs>